I'm Tiffany Ng, Associate Professor of Carillon at the University of Michigan. Thank you for joining us for this session of our 61st Organ Conference, Passions and Visions. Laura Marie Ruslaten is a Carillon recitalist in Oslo, Norway, whom I've had the privilege of getting to know as a passionate advocate for the neurodiverse community. It's our privilege to have her present on the topic, Using Cognitive Accessibility to Improve Clear Communication for All. Lara Marie is here and available to answer your questions via the Zoom Q&A function. Her talk is about 52 minutes long, includes closed captioning, and will be available after the conference for later viewing. Please chime in with questions anytime. Hello, my name is Laura Maria Ruhrslatten, and I am the Kirillinist at Oslo City Hall and Urani World Church. I have a seven-year degree in Caroline performance from Denmark. And I work solo as well as with uh, art projects and different kinds of experimental concerts. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, accessibility at a concert setting for people that have invisible uh, disabilities or invisible health conditions that are somehow making it difficult for them to access concerts and accessibility. And this is a lot from my own experience. I am on the autism ADHD spectrum, and I also have a brain injury from an accident in 2004, where I uh, got injured in the frontal lobe and in the visual processing, which is in the back of the brain. And I have some areas where I have a lot of ability, and then I have some areas where people take a lot of things for granted, that I have lost ability or have almost zero function. And during this uh, talk, I will not be attempting to um, make a neurotypical body language or eye contact or try to push myself into a uh, expression that would not be typical for autism because um, this thing with the body language and how you move and the way that you need to think and process is very different often with different neurotypes. And I want to show you that that's how can that look like. So the first thing I will be talking about is uh, some accessibility suggestions for the information that you're putting out before your concert, your PR. And then I will uh, have a clip with uh, music. And this is um, to kind of rest your brain. <laughs> and then I'll be talking about what about the actual venue. People are getting to the concert venue. They're going to access the venue. What about the person-to-person -person communication? What about your facilities? And then there'll be some music. And then I'll be talking about a more meta level, a deeper level of communication and how getting really conscious about these factors can actually make you a better communicator with many different types of people. It might even help you be a different kind of communicator at your workplace so that you could actually improve the accessibility of your communication as a colleague or in the workplace. And then at the end, I will also have a clip with music. So if anyone noticed, I did a very autistic, friendly <laughs> introduction where first I told you what was going to happen before I actually started talking about that. So if you want to make sure that everyone is on board, I notice neurotypicals don't do this. They don't tell you what's going to happen before it happens. And this is a way to make your information more autistically friendly, um, neurodivergent friendly. Also for the people that don't have very good concentration, tell what is going to happen before you do it. So that's a small example. <laughs> um, moving on to your PR and your information that's going out before your concert. Um, you want as many people to know about the concert as possible. What's happening now is that digital information is taking over and some people are starting to stop doing it on paper and the brochures and everything. 
this can be a good thing for blind people, uh, people that need uh, to hear it. Um, the computer can read the information on the website. This is a catastrophe for people like me, where the digital world is very inaccessible because it takes many steps to find information. I lost the ability to do executive function, and a lot of people lose executive function, such as uh, like chronic fatigue, any kind of ADHD, brain injuries, strokes. Um, like if you have chronic pain, then you just might not have energy to think through things. And many, many steps is not a good thing. So even though I can't go into all the different diseases and conditions out there, because that would take such a long time, um, I'll be giving examples like this that um, are hopefully helpful for many different conditions. The digital and the paper is equally important. If you are not putting information on paper as well as digital, you're not accessible. And your digital um, solution should also have a possibility of being read aloud. And a lot of times it's good to put, uh, if you have a lot of pictures on your website, write a description and text of the picture, such as this picture shows the tower with the carillon and with the performer, and try to describe it. Sensory, put some sensory information in there, like it's sunny, um, there's a tree there, like <laughs> anything that really makes a visual picture in your mind. So for PR, it's really important to have analog and digital equally. And, you know, keep in mind that people's brains have different needs. And it's really important to be clear and concise. And for both of these platforms, the worst thing that I see happening is that people go berserk on design. So they want to have this amazing graphic design and all these little pictures and icons and like 10 different fonts. And please, please consider the sensory impact of your information that as many sensory elements there is, that's like the load of information. So you want to communicate the, like what time is the concert? Where do you go to hear it? Uh, what's the program? Who's performing? Uh, very, very basic things that should be really easy to understand. It should not take like five steps to get there. Like if you have a website, you shouldn't have to be clicking on one thing and then finding a menu and then clicking on a new thing and then clicking on the date and then and then you finally get information on the concert. So everything should be just there. You don't have to go find it. And this is true for the design as well as how many steps does it take you to find information. So if you have brochures, they should be at a really obvious place by your venue. And if you're sending them in the regular post, then they should you know, come maybe have a mailing list if people want to have this in the post. Otherwise, your website should be like, no steps, <laughs> if that's possible. So please stay away from a ton of sensory information that is not related to the actual information that you need to know what this concert is, and decide if you want to go there, and see when and where it is. So, you know, no clutter, no visual clutter, um, no sensory clutter. Um, if you're going to have a website with sound, make sure the sound is telling you something important about the point you're getting across. It's not just a sound for decoration. That could be really disturbing for a blind person or somebody with sensory processing difficulty. A lot of different conditions have very sensitive sensory processing and too much sensory information could actually cause pain or it could be really confusing like cognitive confusion like trying to sort out what's important here and what isn't so never assume that people are going to just know what's important you have to already sort that out for them make it simple
So part two, you get to the venue, there's the actual venue, and there's the person-to-person -person communication. So from my perspective as a person with uh, invisible um, chronic conditions and a, like a legal disability, and a person that experienced that there's no accessibility for my kind of condition. Um, when I get to a venue, people look at me and they assume that I'm pretty neurotypical and there's nothing wrong. If you don't see any kind of challenges on how I look. And then I get to a point where I run into a problem with accessibility. It could be that I have so much pain, I need to sit down, there's nowhere to sit down. Um, it could be that I'm getting an autistic meltdown because there's so much noise and sensory input in that place where you go in, like the foyer, where you show your ticket or where you, you know, get your program or the first thing that you meet at the venue. That's usually such a sensory chaos that you could get an autistic meltdown. Or what if, if you have a condition that gives you seizures and then you're just on the floor all of a sudden in front of all these people? And it feels like there's no safe place to go where nobody's staring at you. And also I feel like people get really surprised that I ask them, um, can you explain to me what I'm supposed to do now? Should I show my ticket first here? And they're looking at me like I'm really strange because they're not used to people asking these questions that they assume everybody knows how to do. I have to ask a lot of questions that are about how do I do this thing? Like, I don't know how to do tasks. I have to have someone tell me step by step, like, when you get to the venue, the ticket thing is over here, you show your ticket first, then you can go there, the restrooms are over there. Um, I need to orientate myself. And a lot of people aren't used to that that's actually necessary. So that's why I'm going to talk about the venue in itself, the design, and the person-to-person -person communication, because both need a lot of improvement. And so when you come to the venue, um, this is for everyone with like Parkinson, mobility issues. Maybe somebody looks like they're drunk because they have a nervous system condition. They're not drunk, they just like have something going on in their nervous system. There's a lot of different diagnoses about that. There's uh, like different kinds of seizures. There's different kinds of autism spectrum, brain injuries, stroke patients. There could be recovered stroke patients that have recovered so much that they can look normal, but there's still stuff that they haven't relearned. So, and then there's, uh, you know, asthma, sensory processing, um, your sensory impression of your venue is incredibly important. So first meeting of your venue, no smells, no perfumes getting through the ventilation. If it's outside, it's probably not a problem. Um, but please try to eliminate all kinds of things that smell like perfume. Um, the location of the garbage, because that might smell if it's full. Um, Anything in the ventilation system, make sure the ventilation system doesn't blow on your skin because like with autism, often your skin can just really hurt all the time. And I can't have any air uh, blowing on my skin at all because it causes extreme pain. And so this is um, tactile smell, um, visual, like please don't have a lot of visual stuff you have to orientate. I mean, your sign should be like, right in front of you, the first thing you see, there's a sign there that says, this is where you go, listening area, there's a big arrow, like restrooms, tickets, uh, maybe you want to write, like, show your ticket, um, go to a foyer, take your seat, like, write it in an order of how you do that. You could paint, if there's inside on the floor, you could paint arrows on your floor, like, this is the way to the restroom. This is the way to the tickets. Um, I've seen that for blind people where they have a raised, uh, like a texture that they can find with the, um, the stick that they're using so that they can guide on the floor. You could do that visually as well. That would help a lot of people with different processing disorders. And so there's this problem of 
you know, knowing what to do when you get there. And the visual noise, please eliminate that as much as possible. The auditive noise also, people get there and they like to do small talk and start talking and blah, blah, blah. And, and then you just get overloaded. And people with, you know, any kind of brain condition or fatigue, it's just too much noise. And people like to talk. So if this, is it possible to do anything with the acoustic conditions? Is it possible to have like a place where like people want to talk and socialize? Like it's really obvious that, okay, here's a place marked where they can do that. What about keeping the necessary things like restrooms and ticket and like your information um, set up? What about protecting those places from like all this noise and activity? What about putting signs there that say, you know, in this area, please use discussion um, with what kind of noise you make? Because people make a lot of noise. Like um, after a brain injury, it's really uncomfortable to be around people because people are not conscious of what kind of sensory noise they're making just by like digging through the purse and putting stuff on the table and talking and their ringtone on the phone is really loud and all of a sudden they're talking really loud and they're yelling to somebody across the room and they're just not conscious of the sensory environment that they're making and any kind of um, like heads up on you know please be conscious of this would be really helpful and another suggestion I have for the venue is that um, if there's seating for the audience, like in an auditorium, where you get a number and a row on your ticket, or if you're in a carillon concert and there's a seating area, please have a really discreet designated system so that people with mobility issues, chronic pain, Parkinson, all kinds of that kind of thing, they don't look like they're handicapped, um, that from those seats where they sit, they can get to the restroom really easy, or they can go out in the lobby and take a break really easy without like trying to step over 10 other audience members. Because sometimes you get yelled at if you say that if you're handicapped, but you're not using a cane or a wheelchair, people yell at you, and they treat you like you're pretending. And that's detrimental, and it also um, keeps you, um, it stops you from getting your necessary needs met. So try designated seating for people with any kind of chronic condition that is pain, reduced mobility, that's invisible. Also try making a sensory room at your venue that's really easy to find, like really obvious to find. Where autistic people, sometimes you have to stim, like stim is like doing movements to like release energy from your nervous system. And a lot of times it's really embarrassing to do that in public because people treat you like absolute crap. <laughs> um, so sometimes people need a room that I would call a sensory room that would be a really comfortable place where there's comfortable lighting, like maybe like orange, red lighting. And try to change the lighting in your venue, like the whole venue, if it's you know too sharp, too much blue, but at least in the sensory room. You should have a really comfortable like places to sit down, uh, lay down, move around freely. Maybe somebody's like coughing a lot or has kind of tics or something. It should be a safe space where people can take a break. It should be really easy to find. The first thing you notice when you get to the venue is like, oh, there's a sense room over there. I can go there if I need a break. And that kind of ties in with the person-to-person -person communication because uh, the people working at your venue should be educated in different kinds of conditions and this, you know, that should be a different seminar, <laughs> that should be like a class. But um, first of all, being able to show people like, oh, you know, did you know we have this like space over here if you need a break? Um, another thing that should always be available like from the first time you get to the venues should always at every place you are be able to sit down always a place to sit down if you have chronic pain or any kind of like fatigue you might not be able to stand in line 
you might not be able to be standing and waiting for the restroom or waiting to get inside, waiting to sit down. Please, everywhere in your venue, make it possible to sit down for everybody. And the people that are working there should be able to say this to people coming as your audience. They should be conscious of that a lot of people might need to sit down or that a lot of people might need help finding really obvious things like where's your tickets or restroom or, you know, you should have water available maybe, um, you know, extra pillows, any kind of like ergonomic thing. I mean, just kind of try doing research on how that could be improved. And the thing about the person-to-person -person communication in the setting is that Body language and assumptions and stigma are so important to get conscious of because body language is not body language. Body language is a neurotypical thing that neurotypicals interpret as a social um, communication. For people with chronic pain, for especially autistic people, um, for any kind of neurodivergent, like for me, body language is not social communication. Body language is an indication of what my nervous system is doing. My body language is also an indication of my sensory like, um, condition. My body language will change a lot if I'm being too sensory overloaded. And this can be misinterpreted as like behavior or social, um, like social hints. And that causes a huge amount of miscommunication it's also really tiring to deal with. I hate being interpreted as if I'm communicating through my body language in a social way because it usually blocks me getting my needs met, like maybe I need to sit down. Um, the assumptions that like autistic people are nonverbal or um, if you have strange movement, you're on drugs or if you if you are struggling to find words, then you know, you're know you dumb. Um, if you have this weird body language, then it means something social. Eye contact is huge. A lot of people think eye contact is really uncomfortable, as well as me. And I have to sometimes close my eyes to actually formulate a sentence. And that's a cognitive brain thing. It doesn't mean anything socially. It doesn't mean you're lying. It doesn't mean that you know you don't want to look at the person. It doesn't mean that you're not listening. It means that like you're struggling to. There's too much sensory input. You're struggling to concentrate. And it can also be like for a lot of autistic people, way too intimate. Eye contact can feel like you know you're taking somebody's clothes off. It feels really wrong. And please don't, if you're working at a venue, don't force eye contact. Don't freak out about body language. Be objective, don't do a lot of small talk. If you want to do, somebody uses small talk with you, go ahead. Don't assume that small talk is like a good thing for everybody. If you've got chronic fatigue and chronic pain, you're like, you know, I don't care, just show me the restroom, you know. Uh, <laughs> let me sit down. <laughs> uh, so your communication should be really pragmatic, like objective. Don't make a deal about what people are doing, how they look. Just communicate information. Ask them, you know, could I help you with anything? Could I show you the restroom? Um, don't ever talk to someone like they're an infant or like a baby or a child in their head. Always address people objectively, intelligently. Be needs-oriented. So think about people's needs and try to meet those needs. Don't think about so much else. You probably won't get to know all the people in your audience. You won't like have this big conversation with them. You're just gonna meet them in a practical way to help them you know, feel comfortable at the concert that you're going to present. Be needs-oriented, objective, practical, pragmatic. Um, think that you're communicating information and not some kind of social bubble, so be direct.
So how can these uh, different aspects help your communication on a deeper level? That's actually an interesting topic because these kind of things help challenge your mind, they help challenge your stereotypes, they help challenge how you greet people, how you think communication, how you think about um, communicating information. It challenges you to put yourself in a perspective that you might ever have not ever experienced. And it might challenge you to actually have to talk to people that are in these situations that you know you have no idea that that's what it's like for them. And also getting more conscious about diversity. Like if you meet one person with chronic pain and then you meet someone else with chronic pain, um, I mean, there's going to be two different individuals anyway. And there's a trap a lot of people fall into where they start thinking, well, we can't make accommodations for everybody, like every single individual. And that's kind of a dualistic trap because either you don't have so much accommodations and you think, okay, everybody should be able to use it. And if they can't get in here, well, that's too bad for them because they didn't have an assistant. That's getting ableist. And if you're on the other side, well, we can't make, you know, trying to make accommodations for like every single individual. That is impossible because that's like, you'd have to get to know everybody really well first. And that would be a bit unrealistic. So you have to think, you don't know people that are coming to your venue that you're talking to. And that's why getting rid of assumptions is so important. Um, training your mind to stop assuming things, please try doing that because assumptions are often not true. Like I notice on the autistic spectrum and as a person that needs really clear, concise information, I will give someone information and then they will assume that this information comes with a whole bunch of other stuff that's like in between the lines. That's really detrimental for me and my contact with other people. Please be more like, um, oh, I don't know what they mean by that. I don't know about the situation. Maybe I should ask them. Maybe I should, you know, try to ask them questions before um, instead of making an assumption. So please work on yourselves. <laughs> um, try doing something mentally to get conscious of, not automatically making so many assumptions that will actually help you and help people communicate with you and make you a person that's easier to communicate with um, maybe more people will feel like you're actually listening to them and there's this thing about um, the discrimination aspect of the invisible disabilities where a lot of people in the autistic community and any kind of invisible disability feel really stigmatized and um, like have no accommodations and that makes it really difficult for us to get out and do things that we want to do. So if you are thinking about like the pride movement with sexuality, um, this is a good comparison because um, this is making it into a um, a consciousness of that sexual diversity is a good thing, it's something to be proud of, it's something that gives us biodiversity within our own species. Um, the same can be said for all these different ways of being, which are different conditions. And please be mindful that some people might say, like, I'm proud of my autism, it's my superpower, I'm so talented because I have autism. Another person might experience autism as like a really huge handicap in their life and they might not want to have autism. And some people might say, I'm autistic. Other people say, I have autism. Please, in your role as like a professional concert venue or meeting people professionally in your workplace, don't get into what people call themselves because that's their choice. Please respect their boundaries, respect. Some people want to say, uh, you know, I'm disabled. Some people say like, you know, I'm beating my chronic pain. Um, it's so many different ways of dealing with these ways of being. So please exercise your social skills in accepting. It's called radical acceptance. You accept what the other person is saying. And if you don't agree, um, I know how can you not agree on somebody else's personal life? I don't know. Um, everyone has to make their own choices. And um, in your role at a professional concert venue as a colleague, 
You know, respect how people describe themselves. Don't put stereotypes on them. Be o more open, uh, curious to learning about what it's like. Um, try talking to a lot of people with different ways of being, different conditions. Um, don't assume that one person's condition applies to everybody else with that condition. Because sometimes it's like, oh, I know a guy with autism. He's nothing like you. And <laughs> that's not really... <laughs> a very conscious thing to say. Um, and you might meet someone that's really sick of talking about their condition. You might meet someone that says like, well, can't you read about that on the internet? You know, um, my take on that is that uh, I can get tired of explaining to people. Another thing that I know is that if people go on the internet, start Googling things, they can get a lot of misinformation. Like, you might not know that if you Google autism, you get Autism Speaks with a Puzzle Piece logo. You might not know that a ton of autistic people find that offensive. We do not support Autism Speaks. We find the Puzzle Piece offensive. So, you know, if somebody doesn't want to talk to you about their condition, you know, respect that, but maybe find somebody that will talk to you about it because it's better than just making assumptions. And, you know, when you are communicating, um, Try to prioritize the practical needs above the social rules that you're used to. Like, remember communicating on email, maybe it would look different for someone with my condition. Don't assume that everyone wants complete sentences. It might help someone that you're not writing complete sentences. It might help someone you're writing like bullet points in an email, keeping it short. Um, don't interpret that as a social signal. Um, please think of that as like a practical accommodation. If somebody's writing an email and they're a colleague, or if there's somebody in your audience is writing an email that's like really practical and none of the, you know, politeness phrases in the beginning and the, you know, the typical ending and the, you know, don't assume that's a social kind of communication. I mean, think of that as a practical way of accommodation of getting their needs met. So try to think outside the box when it comes to all these kind of unwritten, nonverbal social cues that everybody's navigating with. Um, try looking beyond those and think, uh, thinking what is a practical way to communicate here? And that's going to work on your mind. <laughs> it's going to make you start thinking and if you practice this, you will be able to communicate in many different ways. It's something that you learn. It's like learning different languages. So in conclusion, I'd like you to remember to focus on sensory uh, processing. Everything is sensory. We tend to forget that, but any kind of visual, audio, anything you feel on your skin, anything you smell, um, the way that you organize your sentences visually in an email, your design, everything is sensory. Please include the sensory system very consciously in all that you're doing. Um, be direct. Please forget that, you know, sometimes being direct is maybe more polite. It's not so practical. <laughs> being direct is much more practical. Um, it helps people understand you. And be clear. Um, clarity is like, it's related to being direct, but it's like um, for the person receiving information clarity is like you just instantly know what to do. The sign is there. I see where I'm supposed to go. I see in the website what I'm supposed to do. I know exactly what you want me to do. I know how this works. That's all sorted out. That's clarity. So sensory system, be direct in your person-to-person -person communication and please focus on clarity and in the comfort of your venue for different kinds of conditions. Thank you.
Hi, Laura Marie. First of all, I just want to say, uh, <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for um, producing this extraordinary video for us. Um, I have personally learned so much from you um, over the years that we've been uh, known each other, and even so much more uh, just in this uh, uh, past hour here. So I think uh, our visitor Chris Berry summed it up perfectly. Just deepest thanks for your music and this very clear, direct, and important presentation. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of questions here. I'll read them out loud, uh, each one. Uh, starting with Jesse Houghton, uh, how have you seen design for accessibility benefit not just individuals with disabilities, but also everyone else? Yeah, great question, because I feel like that's how everyone can benefit from diversity. Uh, it's the clarity and the way it's more thought through uh, of the design and like just the consciousness of that they've maybe sorted out the most important information is just really clear and um, very instantaneous. You see it, you know, there's no steps. So I, I believe that people with tired nervous systems are excellent guinea pigs for all kinds of communication and design because they're gonna filter out what doesn't work and it's actually benefiting everybody else's brain, I think. It's less tiring. That makes perfect sense. Uh, we also have a question from Michelle Lamb. Uh, you mentioned that the range of accessibility concerns is large and often invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we keep up to date on best practices as uh, research and understanding continues to advance? That's like if you're employed as a medical professional, um, you might have a, a bigger, like, um, um, you might have to be required to do more research because of your job. Um, and research is just like constant research. Um, and then you kind of have to know what sources are best, how to access these sources. And I think, the books I recommend are a good place to start, but like as a regular lay person that you have no idea where to start and you don't know anything about this, I think it would be really good to just um, talk to as many people with different needs, different conditions as you can and ask them about, you know, how did you learn more about your condition? Can you recommend me an article to read? Um, you know, do you have a friend that could tell me more about this? Like, do you have people on Instagram, like I have a lot of autistic people on Instagram that are very much like uh, progressive and cutting edge in their understanding of autism and also um, traumatic brain injury. So maybe ask them where they get their information about their own condition, but it is a constant and you have to kind of have a cutting edge mentality, like always updating and don't get like an ego trap is like, oh, I already know that or you know, somebody told me 10 years ago, it's like that. So I know that just, you know, constantly, you know, any way you can get feedback from people that actually live like with these conditions. That is such a, um, uh, you get to the heart of the matter, which is being in contact with members of the yeah. community. Um, and I'll just tell everyone, like, the way I started to learn from Laura Marie was following her on Instagram. Uh, so if people are allowed to follow you, maybe you can yes. drop your <laughs> handle in the chat. Yeah, I can write that down. <laughs> yeah. uh, one person, anonymous attendee, asked uh, if there are already any venues that have a sensory room. Uh, they haven't seen one yet, and it sounds like such a great idea. I would love to see one. Uh, <laughs> I suggested that because I know a lot of people would love to have that and I've never actually seen that so it's like I wish there was this thing so I've unfortunately I don't have a place where I can say like go see their sensory room but I hope people start making them and I hope there's somewhere out there that actually does um, do it or at least uh, like um, emergency rooms or some medical centers or you know somewhere somehow is designed for like sensory comfort of the patients or the attendees or whatever kind of place it is. 
I guess I've seen something at the American Musicological Society conferences. Oh. They're massive conferences. And uh, in the past few years, they've had a quiet room. Oh. And I think it would be so nice to have this for concerts, too. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jesse also asks, are there some social media platforms or websites that have better built in accessibility than others? Do you have a favorite website or app as an example? Yeah. A lot is really inaccessible. Um, I can't use Facebook. It's visually terrible. Um, the only platform I use is Instagram because it's instantaneous. It's like everything, all the icons like to put a post, it's just there on the screen. You don't have to go through many steps. So Instagram is the only uh, platform I use. And then a lot of apps are difficult and it really depends on the a designer of the app so some are terrible that have many steps every time you use them um, some is like with the iphone you can use the face recognition or the fingerprint to instead of like 300 steps to log in um, i can show you the one i i love the app is um the best design i've seen so far is um this little european washing machine app which is like a, a laundry room it's called app wash you click on it it goes app wash and then um, it's logging me in automatically because it's set that on the iPhone. As soon as you open it, this is a screen. It's a picture and I, okay, I'm going to wash. So all I have to do is um, touch the washing machine. And then it tells me which washing machine is uh, available. I find the number of the one and I press play and it's done and it deducts from my credit card. So that's one of the good examples of you know, easy design. And that's one of the only apps I use without getting symptoms or something. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. That's such a great example that the uh, clear instructions and everything laid out in front of you, uh, that's not just for when you arrive at a concert venue, it's, it's even on your phone. Everywhere. Yeah. 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 Well, it looks like we have one last question that came in. That's from Christina Toller, and she asks, uh, how do attitudes, uh, in your experience, how do attitudes towards accessibility vary in different countries? Are some places more accommodating than others in general? And I know that as an international touring performer, mm -hmm. you've had quite some experience. Yeah, um, it really depends on your condition. Um, it's just so dependent on the condition. For me, um, developing countries uh, are actually easier access to me concerning digital because they haven't got so far in digital stuff. So like India and and I've been to like um, South Africa, that's actually really good for me because they don't have, it's like they don't assume that everybody has digital access. They haven't made an infrastructure that's digital. So I like traveling in developing countries, but I can't tell them that I've like got autism because maybe some countries still believe that like autism is like a demon or a spirit or, you know, it just really depends on the culture and, um, you know, how up to date they are in science or beliefs or, you know, any kind of religion around that kind of thing. So you have to just be really like tuned into where you're going. <laughs> and, I know that Japan is wonderful for like logistics because they've just got everything planned and everything is really clear. And Netherlands is also really like logistically well thought out, like public transportation and systems that are like really easy for public to use. Um, Norway is confusing. We don't have such good infrastructure that's so clear. And you know, in a lot of countries, it just really depends on the actual venue or the people you're talking to, because you could have a really good experience in one city and then in the next city, it's just terrible. So, yeah, but kind of think about the mentality and the, the science and the belief systems and the actual infrastructure. It's kind of all plays in. All right. Uh, I 
I really appreciate uh, your insight that going to countries without this assumption that everyone is digital is actually um, more accessible. I'm going it's to nice. start. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start thinking more about building our Carillon program this way. So yeah, <laughs> um, well. Your performances were so beautiful. I loved hearing you play these gorgeous carillons. And uh, just before we leave, uh, do you have another performance coming up soon that uh, you can tell us about? Um, next is in Innsbruck in December. Oh, awesome. Um, so it's it's a uh, ice bath from the 80s and it's in the um, just behind the town square. And it's a nice listening area and it's for the Christmas market. So it's the Alps and probably snow, at least on the peaks and Christmas and the bells. So that's really nice. That sounds beautiful. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Laura Marie, and also to each one of you um, attendees and the people who asked questions and left comments. Uh, thank you to all of your for your participation. And I hope maybe out of what one of these uh, uh, one of you participants will come this sensory room idea. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. I want to go there if you make one. <laughs> all right. Have a good day, everyone, and good good night, Laura Marie. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.